morning. My name is Matt Clark, and I've been working for about five years now at the state of North Carolina on a multi-site Drupal distribution that has about, as of this very moment, about 75 total sites. Um, we still have a few sites actually in Drupal 7. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but I just want to talk about, like, I'm not sure. I'll try to you know, read, read y'all and what you're interested in, because I go a couple different directions with this. But I thought maybe just give you a high level of kind of what the platform's about, what our principles are in terms of building it. And I, ha and I will say, I don't know if I mentioned this in my synopsis of the talk, but we are, we are all in on AWS. And we like using AWS. If you're interested in that at all, I can share some things that are useful for us in the context of going D7 to D8, then 9 in AWS. Uh, I'll show you some cool tricks, maybe. Um, or maybe you show me something. Um, and also maybe try to share some challenges too and try to, you know, maybe y'all can share some knowledge with me and vice versa. Um, but basically, I'm gonna talk about kind of just the lessons learned from as we've migrated now 67, I believe 67 sites from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 since 2019. I actually looked this up and I'll show it to you later. I ha our first commit to our Drupal 8 repository was in 2019. So we had a pretty late start. We really didn't get going until we started hearing about the AOL, and we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so I'll, I'll share some, some stories about that as we go through. And I, I just want to talk for a minute, though, about some of our principles. And so like, one of our foremost principles, and this is, I, I'm part of the Department of Information Technology at the state of North Carolina. And so what we're trying to do is we, we have sites for all manner of state government entities. You talk about Department of Health and Human Services, Governor Cooper's site, everything. Um, and we try to promote digital equity and inclusion by the tools, by the way we build out our platform, and it is a single application, mind you, it's a multi-site application. So everything is running on one code base, and we have a shared configuration conf as well, and I'll share, share with you a little bit of detail about how we got that done. But um, you know, basically we think of ourselves as the front door for constituents of North Carolina to get to government services, and so www.nc.gov, that is us in Drupal 9, and we're really working to consolidate information about state government services in there, and so one of the things that we're really working hard on is having Drupal 9 integrate with other web services and other maybe kind of dated state government systems that aren't as cloud, aren't cloud native. We are fully cloud native and aren't Drupal. Um, and we've also moved a lot of old Drupal 7 sites into Drupal, including, for example, there's the state community college system that kind of oversees all the community colleges in North Carolina. They're on an old Drupal 7 site and they're paying 50 grand a year right now to maintain that. And so we're trying to move them over to our platform in D9 and also save them all that ridiculous hosting costs. So that's about half of what it costs us to run the whole, the whole thing in AWS. I mean, they're paying out the nose. So we are, like I said, we try to eliminate duplication of effort with Drupal multi-site. Now I'm gonna tell you a few details about our multi-site configuration because we don't use the standard, which you'll see on drupal.org, how to do it. We don't have the sites array and we don't have the sites directory. And I'll, sh I'll show you some details about how we do that. Um, but basically the key differences are we don't have that folder. We have like a directory for each site. What we have is uh, short code mappings that are per site that we map at the production level to the production host names. And then everywhere else, our non-production environments are just, um, you know, the environment name and then the short code identifying the site. And then that takes you to the, the database. And that from, from these two details from the host name, we're able to get our database credentials and from environment variables and kind of deliver the site that's needed. But that way, we have one site or one application that's behind an application load balancer in AWS. And it, should, and it, can, it is serving the request for all 75 of these sites. Okay, one tweak that we had to do that was, that was sort of a unique thing about our implementation is Drush did not work the way we had originally set it up. We had to remove the URI argument that it was passing into Drupal when you use the dash L flag, and the dash L flag is the way that we run Drush commands on the application. Uh, if you're familiar with that, it's basically you're passing a host name to Drush to tell it which site in a multi-site distribution that you want to perform the Drush command on. And I mean, this has been really helpful for us because if you're going in, if you need to do something like an individual Drush command on a specific site, you can go in and source the specific environment variable that you need for that site and then your Drush command will only work for that site. So it's also good if you're accidentally, you know, use the wrong site, or do a dash L flag for the wrong site. It's not gonna work because you didn't source the environment variable in your session. Um, so with configuration, we have a shared baseline configuration for all 75 sites, okay? And we also, to, it, the only way that it was possible to make that work really was with config ignore and config split. Who, who's familiar with those modules? 
some familiarity. Those were crucial to us, okay? Um, what we did in config split was we, made, we really tried to avoid per site split, okay? You could have a, we could have a config split per site, maybe based upon the shortcut of the site. We really don't want to do that because then that defeats the purpose of having a baseline configuration. We wanted a baseline configuration, so if we want to enable a new module on all the sites, we just add it to composer.json, we add it to core.extension.yaml, and we do a deployment, and our deployment runs the config import on all sites, and all sites have the module, and it's, it's very quick, and we have an automated deployment in GitHub Actions that facilitates the Drush actions required after the code base is deployed. Um, so that's why we wanted the baseline config, and we spent a lot of time when we started out in Drupal 8. Are y'all, all, all, everyone working in Drupal 9 now, or are there Drupal 7 people are still, you're still working, you're all Drupal 9, all Drupal 9? So anyone still in Drupal 7? Okay, so we, we spent a lot of time when we were moving out of Drupal 7 just trying to figure this part out. Because I don't know if, if y'all are familiar with Drupal 7, if you remember features, we had features, but there were a ton of features that were very um, <laughs> overridden, basically. <laughs> like they, were, they were not enforced. So in Drupal, in Drupal 7, your configuration management options, one was features, and you could override those really easily in the, ad, in the admin interface. And so it was just a total mess. And, and we kind of inherited a Drupal 7 platform that we had to kind of rebuild from scratch in Drupal 8. So we chose for the baseline configuration to be that way. Now, there's one thing you might be wondering. Views and web forms, if you allow users to do anything with views and web forms, and we only do that in a very limited way, but we do have site-specific views and web forms on most sites. So what we decided to do was, in config ignore, some of you are familiar with this, you can specify a wildcard on your machine name for a view, for example, and then you can basically specify any, any view with the machine name beginning in CC underscore, in our case, is going to be config ignored. And so we made a custom module to prepin that to any user created view, and that way that gives us the flexibility to continue. If we need to add, we have sort of baseline views that we have for the customers to use, news, press releases, blog entries, stuff like that. This gives you an option to go in and roll something like that out that goes out everywhere, but people are still in the admin creating their own views, and obviously if you didn't have this, and if you didn't ignore this, those views would get deleted if you ran a config import with our baseline configuration, because those views are not in our baseline configuration, the user-created views. So this gives us a way to save user-created views and allow them to make them, and also allow us to roll out new ones. And sometimes we roll out templates that they will duplicate and reuse, so it's, it's, that's been really helpful for us. And we have a custom, we build a little custom module that just in the back end with a form alter. Basically what it does is just make sure that NCC gets appended. Even if their machine name is way too long, and it will shorten it and make sure it has NCC in front of it, basically. Um, so migrations were super hard. Uh, I know we have one person still in Drupal 7. We had a lack of, like I said, a lack of enforced config management in Drupal 7. Lots of overwritten features, really big sites. I'll show you one. It's dq.nc.gov. It's environmental quality. 136,000 index results on that site. It's not all Drupal nodes, but the database is the biggest I've ever seen. I can't, don't ask me the exact size, uncompressed, but it's very large. I think the migration scripts in total had to run for 12 hours or something like that. It was ridiculous. Um, so yeah, that was awful. Um, yeah, we've got one left now. I think we migrated to in total about 58 Drupal 7 sites. There's the Department of Commerce's website is still in Drupal 7. That's the last one we're gonna migrate. We're actually gonna migrate on Monday. And then we're gonna be done and hopefully have a little celebration. Um, as, as you can see, so wait, like 58 doesn't line up with 75. We've been adding new sites natively in Drupal 8 and then natively in Drupal 9 as we've gone. We, we upgraded to Drupal 9 in September of 2021 and we did have a little bit of work on our migration scripts to get those running in Drupal 9. There were a few minor tweaks we had to make there. Um, but we, once we got those, we were able to just start natively migrating from Drupal 7 to 9 and it really wasn't that bad. I think it was maybe two weeks of work to update our scripts. Um, what else? So yeah, the, so media, if y'all have dealt with media links, if you had, in Drupal 7, you had direct links to files, we had to replace those, we tried to replace those with media links, but there wasn't a really easy way for us to do that. We could find, we had to make a custom Drush command that did a lookup. You have, you have an idea for that? Yeah. I'd love to, what did you guys end up doing? Uh, there's a uh, contrib module called the Migrate Media Handler. Migrate. Okay, okay. Designed for that. Cool, okay, I'll check that out. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Like that migrate media handler. Yeah, we, we had a time with that. We ended up having to do kind of, we'd migrate the whole site, and then we'd rewrite file links with a custom drush command at the end. Um, so, yeah, so it was kind of annoying. Uh, one thing we did, we had in our, in our dev environment, we'd run the migrations in our dev environment, 
because it was in the same AWS location network-wise as our staging environment in Drupal 7, so we'd just migrate, we'd migrate in there, and sometimes that was awkward because is our Drupal 8 dev environment, we're actively developing in Drupal 8, and we're trying to run migrations. I try to run them at night, so it wouldn't interrupt, because if somebody ran a deployment, it would break the migrations. So we had to just try to, you know, muddle through as best we could, try to run those in off hours, because we had automated deployments and non-prod. The main thing we're really trying to do as an organization with this, and why we think what using Drupal has been really great for the state, is that what we see over and over again is people going out and spending 50 grand, 100 grand on a website. And we come in, and we've got a multi-site application that can serve most of their needs. And that ends up, when, when we add a new site, it used to be every time the state government won a new website, they'd spend $50,000, $150,000. And now every time they launch a new website, they save money with us because we can leverage economy of scale with AWS. And we have you know, an AWS Enterprise account through the state of North Carolina. And so we have the AWS Shield Advance, very nice tool for DDoS protection alongside WAF v2. These are our top sites in the in the Drupal multi-site platform by traffic share. Um, yeah, you can see, like, this was actually, this is one particular week, I think, where I took this pie, and so it changes sometimes. Obviously, state parks grows really big during the summer, as you can imagine. Uh, Department of Revenue is really high at the time. That's DOR because of tax season. We've got several, DHHS has, is a huge organization within the state, so that's actually Medicaid is part of that. And then Employment Security is actually the most recent site. They're still in Drupal 7. If you go look at des.nc.gov right now, but we have it done in Drupal 9, and I'm going to show you, if I can get to it, how we launch a site from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9. We have two production environments running concurrently, obviously, with Drupal 7 and Drupal 9. And we can switch between those really seamlessly with an AWS tool that I want to share. have a ton of contributors. We really we try to invite you know, vendors to collaborate with us. We use GitHub for our code repository. Um, and like I said, we very recent, like our new, one of our newest um, folks coming on board, they're paying 50 grand right now to, for just for support. No, no development. And this is a Drupal 7. It's, it's three or four Drupal 7 sites. But it's just a nightmare what's, what some of these, these agencies are paying. It's just, so we, we're, we are moving this site now. It's currently paying. You yeah, could extrapolate that across all the sites. Imagine if they were all paying that much. Um, it's ridiculous. And it's a lot more than what we charge. And so... Yeah, our whole team in total is just 11 employees. And like I said, we, you know, now it's at 75 production sites now. We've got over 2,000 content creators across all of our roles. Um, and all the infrastructure is cloud native in AWS. And we have full control over our AWS account um, with, some, with some oversight by the cloud engineering team at DIT. And we do, imp we do um, use several REST APIs that we've developed that kind of integrate with Drupal, bring some data into Drupal easily. Um, there are some things where we used to do in Drupal 7 with feeds, and we stopped doing them with feeds because feeds are really clunky, we found. And also, feeds tend to want to create nodes, and we don't always want to create nodes with external data because then you have to update the nodes, and it also clogs up the content interface for the user. So we really tried to get away from that. I think I have an example in here to show you how that works um, for us. Um, so for us with our cloud setup, it's basically we use root 53 and cloud front in front of it. It's actually, it's not an ELB, it's an application load balancer in AWS. And then we've got uh, an ASG in here with our application layer. And then for the database, we use RDS. And I don't know that I have that actually reflected in this. I apologize. Uh, and we have, we do use Redis. And I was going to mention that we do use clustered Redis in Drupal 9 with the patch that's there in the... Um, there's a long maintained patch that's never been added or made into its own project within the Redis project, if you're familiar with that. It allows you to use clustered Redis, and we've been using that. And then our public files are in S3, and that's worked really well for us. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll show you a few details about this implementation. They're kind of cool. So, you know, leveraging CloudFront has been huge for us. Automating non-production deployments has been huge for us, especially as we onboarded senior developers for our front-end design, UX. They iterate very, very frequently, and they need deployments, and they need to see their work really fast. So automating those was huge. So dev UAT and staging are all automated. Um, yeah, we commit wherever possible to infrastructure as code on our AWS layer. And then obviously, like I was saying, we try to decouple the big data from Drupal via APIs. And we don't use feeds anymore. We're dispensing with feeds and just letting Drupal talk to APIs and bring in data that way. Um, so one cool thing we do, and this is sort of leads into how we launch from D7 to D9, is we have uh, basically all of our um, domains go with our C name, like our production domains are C named to a root 53 um, 
alias record that we control, usually it's production dash the shortcode for the site basically, and what that points to is to a CloudFront distribution that then has an origin at our ALB. And so what are the advantages of that? I, you know, I can share some more documentation about to try to like break that down a little more, but cool things you can do with that. We can roll out our SSL certificate to everything in one go. You, add, you can import it in an Amazon certificate manager and attach an Amazon certificate managed SSL cert to a group of CloudFront distributions automatically. That makes it very, very easy to update SSL certificates and it also makes it really easy to update from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, and I'll show you that too. So I think I have another, should be back. So this is really cool. So basically, we have, again, we have that, AL, we have that CloudFront um, alias record, and it's going to an ALB. Now we can change which ALB, or actually, we'll, we'll, we send it all to the same ALB, but at this layer, at the CloudFront layer, you can specify to CloudFront, to add a certain HTTP request header when it goes down to the ALB to direct traffic to a target group that would have your servers that have your Drupal application hosted, right? And so we, what we do when we launch from D7 to 9 is we send a header here in this layer that says, hey, this is a Drupal 9 site. And then the ALB sees that and it has a listener rule that says, okay, I see that. I'm gonna send it to the target group with the D9 servers. And so you can see, you have a CloudFront distribution, let's say for the one we're about to do, employment security is on Drupal 7. We add that header, we use Terraform to do that. Mm. The header gets added, immediately, immediately launch to D9, no downtime. It's very, very um, efficient. And if we need to roll back, we never have, but if we need to, it would be instantaneous, essentially as well, as long as it takes to make the API call in the AWS CLI to change the CloudFront. It's a CloudFront configuration to send the header. ALB sees header, says, okay, that means target group two, instead of target group one, which is, let's say, the default behavior. Okay, so that's been super useful for us. The other thing is WAF. I don't know how y'all have been doing with spam on web forms in Drupal 9. We've been having a lot of trouble with that. Um, we've been trying to mitigate it a little bit with WAF, just because it's, more, it's less expensive for us. We were looking at maybe getting enterprise Google recapture. Um, because we're getting a ton of, we, we, get a, we got a billion requests in the just ended fiscal year total, web requests across the whole platform. We average about 100,000 per month, a little less, actually like 90, 90 million, sorry, 90 million requests per month. So the web forms are getting hammered. We see people spamming us sometimes. We have the recapture module, we have the baseline Google recapture, but we still get a lot of spam. I don't, and we think it's getting circumvented because we're hitting the cap. Google recapture has a cap if you don't pay for how many requests you can serve recaptures to. I think we're hitting that really early whenever the threshold for the month for the month or whatever, and then we're getting blasted. So we use WAF to try to mitigate some of that. We have some rate limiting rules in WAF. You can just say, you know, certain amount of any IP, certain number of requests you get for five minutes. You go over that in a rolling five minute window, you're getting four or three. And we put we have some things like that in. We have some of that dynamically for like country of origin too. So if you're out of the United States, if your IP originates out of the United States, obviously you have a VPN, whatever. But if your IP originates out of the United States, we have a little stricter rate limiting rule. And then the other cool things really we've been loving is using GitHub Actions. And we have a self-hosted runner. We use an AWS and EC2 for that. And we basically use that to automate when you merge a pull request to an environment branch. So our non-production environment branches are developed, UAT and staging. When that is merged, the deployment starts and it pings in Slack and it does all the things. And we have a self-hosted runner in EC2 for that. And that's been, like I said, we used to do this manually. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, three or four years ago. And we didn't have a front-end developer and we were doing manual deployments. And I couldn't even imagine having a front-end developer now and, and not having automated deployments. And we wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to work. So that's been absolutely huge for us. Um, so yeah, so yeah, this is sort of the structure of it. You can create a workflow in GitHub and you basically just, it's just YAML essentially and it tells you, you set up the sort of the trigger. So the trigger for us is on push to these three branches and then it does the things. It builds the code base out, it produces an artifact, uploads it to S3 and then it's downloaded by an actions runner and deployed to our non-production environment depending upon which one of these. And this, these, are, these are variables that you can pull back out and you can pull other variables like pull request number if you want to use that in your file name or something. Um, and you can also have GitHub secrets that can be pulled out through here uh, if you need a secret for whatever reason for this. Um, and then again, like I mentioned, Ter Terraform is our infrastructure of code choice. Um, we reuse it. Um, it's very quick to change things like, I don't know, if we got a site that's in our production infrastructure but we don't want it live yet. It hasn't been launched. Let's say it's exactly like des.nc.gov d9. It's not live yet. 
but it's basically ready. We're waiting for the thumbs up from the stakeholders to move it. And it's in our non-production WAF, so it can only be accessed by our state network. And you change one line in Terraform, and it flips it, and it's ready. It's publicly accessible. So you can change the WAF assignments at that CloudFront configuration level, just like the D8 to, or D7 to D9 header configuration change I mentioned. So we love having CloudFront in front of our Drupal application, is what I'm saying. <laughs> And so again, I'm going back to that API point I was making. We try not to ask too much of Drupal. We have asked too much of Drupal in the past and it has let us down. We try to use feeds to import it, data, for example, about the, this, these juvenile justice service centers, this juvenile justice service directory. We imported thousands and thousands of nodes and it created, created a big mess on the Department of Public Safety's website. So we changed it and we found another solution, a contrib module that maybe some of you have heard of. I, I found it in the last year and I really liked it and I wanted to show it to you. Um, and basically, it, it's, it's, very, it's very rudimentary, but it's, it's called Views JSON Source. And it basically allows you to provide a JSON URL to Drupal views, and then you can render a pretty rudimentary view in Drupal with uh, the JSON. So Drupal can consume JSON via a view with this. It's still, I, you know, if, you, if, any, if you're interested in checking it out, it still needs some help. I've written some patches for it. Um, it's, it's still in its early stages. It's not being really actively maintained, but I feel like it's a good idea. It, could, it has some good in applications. If you have JSON somewhere and you need to bring it into Drupal really quickly, check that out. You can do some cool things with it. You can do some basic filtering with it. Um, I, don't, if you don't, I don't think if you had a massive amount of data, you might not want to do it. But if you're just, you're just trying to get a little bit of data into Drupal, you don't want to do feeds, you don't want to do migrations, it's super fast and easy, I found nothing easier than this. Um, so, and then, so Drupal is a web app. So this is another thing we've been working on. This is, we, we have some integrations between Drupal and other things. So one cool thing that AWS has is a text-to-speech tool. You give Drupal, or you give AWS text. It's called AWS Poly. You give it text and it returns speech. And so we built something over here that's integrated into our Drupal application. We've done a lot of little, like, kind of special use case applications that are built into the platform. And basically just provide a CSV file. And this, in this case, the use case is for first responders, firefighters, EMTs that need rate automated voice radio files. And so they upload a CSV like this that has the gendered voice, the text to speak, and then the file name they want. They upload that as a CSV right here, and they get back a um, zip file that has all the audio files for the individual file by file. Each one of these rows would be a specially formatted WAV file for their Motorola radios that has this, this text being spoken by either a male or a female voice. And the way we did that was Webform Handler, at Drupal side, AWS use API Gateway, connect to the Poly service here, and then there's just a Lambda function that API Gateway does. But API Gateway is basically a really easy way to build up an API. And you just have, you can choose, you know, like, okay, you have a get request, okay, what do you want the get request to trigger? I wanted to trigger a Lambda function in this case that invokes this. So Lambda gets the request that includes the, the CSV, and then the Lambda function converts it to the, uh, the audio and sends it up, and then it gives you a link to it, and it, oh, and it throws it up on S3. And then this Drupal gets, all Drupal gets back, it gives the CSV, it gets back an S3 URL to a zip file with voice lines in it. It was pretty cool. And it's helped, to, it's really, we've heard like across the country we, that first responders have appreciated having this tool. It's being used more widely than just North Carolina. Um, and like again, like I said, it's just a, at the Drupal level, all it is is a web form handler that we added. And the web form handler just looks for this field and then sends it to our endpoint at API Gateway. So web form handlers, we do a lot of work with that. Because like we said, we do a lot of integrations with external data sources. Okay, so I was going to just kind of go back in time and just reflecting, you know, like I said, in January 14th, 2019, we did the first commit for our Drupal 8 repository. It was a, it was a battle. I mean, I'm, I'm proud that we made it this far. I feel like there was times where we thought we weren't going to be able to make it because we just started so late. Um, and that time I was looking, and I think we have, so I was going to show you, we have something like, uh, let me get out of this. <laughs> the original, an original commit, let me pull this up. We had something like, yeah, look at our, these are all the modules we had <laughs> we started. And I think now we have we have a, a way too many, and I'm trying to get this down. <laughs> we have so many modules, um, but yeah, we started and we started very humbly from the uh, composer template for Drupal 8, um, which is still around. I don't know how well up, it's still being kept up to date for Drupal 9. It's not. Uh, it's not. That's a shame. Um, Drupal Core has a template. Drupal Core is it okay? Core 
and it's composer. It's set up for composer. Does it have the scaffolding and stuff? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, we really benefited from that. So with this, you know, if if you have like the composer scaffolding set up, you know, you can set up things that are not Drupal modules, or not all your dependencies need to go into your module slash contrib, right? So you have you guys, your Drupal modules are set up to go into contrib, and you have you know like still have Rush down here that doesn't need to go into the vendor folder, right? And you can also have Bower assets in here, and we so we have some front end libraries we brought in like that. Um, so yeah, that's those are the main things I wanted to share. Does anybody have any questions or any specific things they wanted to ask about? I have a couple hey. problems that are pretty general, but what are the, the huge challenges? Like what are the major drawbacks to? You know, so? Good question. What are the huge challenges? So one of the biggest challenges is just I always I think I do I have a tab to show you. We we have people that want their own look and feel. So we have, if you guys can see, I'll show you just, we can go look. So this is our new theme. And we got, we did, uh, it's the Bootstrap Barrio, Bootstrap 5 Barrio, and we did a sub-theme of that. And that's, this has been super well received, and it's working really well. We have hardly any sites on this. We're going to try to move everything to this. This is the same problem we ran in Drupal 7. We had to just say, part of the reason we started so late on 8 was we were just, we were trying to add new features to 7. And we eventually just had to say, we're done. We're not developing in 7. Forget about it. We're all in on 8. And we had to do the same. Now we're doing it on the front end, where we're saying, we are only developing in our new theme, our NC Barrio Bootstrap 5 theme, and our base theme, which I, sh I will show you. And we still, this is a Drupal, so I'm going to show you a Drupal 9 site. You see a Drupal 9 site right here. It's a load up. I don't know if I'm, am I on the Wi-Fi? Anyway, yeah, yeah, okay. So this same, same application, Drupal 9 site. We have default theme config ignored, so this can be switched by the admin. We don't, we're going to want to do it in a coordinated way. But we need to get everybody off of this old theme. This is the theme we ported over from a 2015 a, a project in Drupal 7 started in 2015, and we ported it to Twig, and we just we ported some pre-process. We did the best we could because we got paralyzed a lot of times by people not wanting to take risks. I think I think that there's a fear of taking risks, and there's a fear of doing something new. And we were trying. We looked at doing it when we first started in Drupal 9 or Drupal 8, really doing Bootstrap 4. And try and do the new theme in Bootstrap 4 to kick off our new D8 application. We just got bogged down on the details of the changes. How's it going to look? And this and that. And it was a nightmare. So we just gave up and we ported this theme. This is how the Drupal 7. I can show you. I actually don't think we have a Drupal 7 site in production anymore that runs this theme. But this is ported from Drupal 7. I'm glad to say that. Um, and so we're trying to move everyone to this. We have the capability to do it. But we just have to, we have to get all the stakeholders on board. We have so many stakeholders. 75 sites. It's different state government communications offices and organizations and entities. Some care more than others. And what we're, we're really just trying to make, we're trying to promote digital equity and make, give them tools to be inclusive to citizens and constituents across North Carolina. But part of, part of how we have to do that is we've got to expand our reach. So we've got to satisfy what they want. And oftentimes, they just want to put a bunch of PDFs up on their site. And we've got to tell them, well, that's, that's yeah, yeah, exactly. We do that. And we, try, and we try to help them, but we also try to push them in the right direction. We give them the tools. But if we, don't get, if we don't help their immediate business needs as well, then we become irrelevant because they won't go with us. They'll go it alone and fail and maybe come back to us in a year or two. But it's, you know. So this, this is the big thing that we're working on right now is we've got like 50 plus sites running this theme. We want them back over here. We want them in this. And it, it's, they're both there. They're available. They're, they're installed. I think they uh, might not actually be installed yet on the base theme sites. But it can be switched. It's just... We're doing a few, there's a few things that we haven't quite supported components that we have, like paragraph types and what have you, that we're still polishing for this theme. I could show you, so there's some of them on this page, actually. We've got like, this is so like an article card paragraph type. Um, we've got like a wider, two, you know, like a two column band. We have basically like nested paragraphs for our landing pages uh, that we do, uh, which is nest paragraphs. Um, and some view implementations too. Uh, but this has been really, really, very well received, but it does not, this is, this is sort of, this site was purpose built to use this theme, and the other sites have used a lot of different components, so we're just trying to make sure we have support for all of those before we start moving them. But we have said, for this theme, going back to D D D natural and cultural resources, this theme, we don't do anything on this theme anymore, unless maybe a break fix, if a break fix were to arise. I mean, it's pretty solid at this point I mean, for what it is. It doesn't look that great, but it's not buggy. Um, so we've done that. We've stopped. We're all in on the new theme. And so it's the same, trying to learn that lesson again, basically. I think that, so those are two of the challenges I would say is like, when you, when, if you, for seven to nine, I mean, y'all remember with seven to eight, it was like a whole new application or just start from scratch. And I don't think our, and I'll tell you, that's another challenge. Our leadership did not understand that. They thought it was a software upgrade, I think. 
And this was on us for not communicating that better because we didn't fully understand it either at first. And I think over time we were able to make that clear that this is really, we're building a whole new application with Symphony. So it's, <laughs> you can't bring over anything really other than maybe some of the, the front, front end layer. And you know, even in 2019, I don't know about y'all, but a lot of the contrib modules in D8 were not in the same place as the D7 counterparts, right? You couldn't get the same. So we had to do a lot of custom stuff to kind of bridge that gap. Any other questions on, on that? Okay, cool. Well, th thank you all for having me. Um, I actually have one more. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. yeah. What makes the site, it's kind of similar to the last one, but do you yeah. have a pretty strict like, upfront for, for what makes a site not a candidate to be included in the multi-site portfolio? Yeah, good question. I mean, a lot of it is sort of functionality and also just sort of making sure it's a good fit in terms of we're on the same page with the leadership. One of the things that we've said no to recently, there's a, something that had a lot of GIS integrations and they also wanted to have users log in that and do things that we that are more we really just have user account user roles for editing the site content and there's different le levels right like a, we have a site admin it's the top level and they still can't do a lot in the config right but then we have uh, like publisher editor down there's something with GIS where they wanted to do a lot more than we felt like we had the time to do we got to use our time really wisely because we just don't have that many resources so if they can't use what we already have and again that's why we have the baseline config we have a set of offerings we have a wide set of offerings if they can't use that and and them coming on would mean a bunch of custom dev that's usually when we say no but every we do have and I will I say I want to thank you know like leadership for this they have a they will send anybody who's doing an RFP for a website they come talk to us first they're required to and so we have those conversations and we don't force anyone onto it but it, we've saved we've saved a lot of money that way by just preventing RFPs where it would have been like I said duplication of effort that we eliminated with this so thanks great great questions thank you for that um, yes so could, could you sort of go back to the beginning and yeah. say a little more explicitly what you mean by multi-site? Is it one code base and a yes. bunch of separate databases for each site? Yes, I can show you. Let's, let's look at the code base. Oh, there's the Drupal project. So let's see, I was pulling up my initial. Okay, so yeah, it's um, one code base. This is the code base. Uh, I'll show you the, how the web root's set up and everything. And I'll get, well, I don't, sorry, I need the Wi-Fi. Did it work? I need to get off WireGuard, I think. Okay, that's probably my fault. I'll get your question, too. I'm sorry, I'll just I'll show this. I, but yes, yes, to answer your question, if the internet fails me, okay, I can actually show you, hopefully. Go to the code base for a minute. Um, yeah, it's one code base, and here it is. Um, the config directory, so shared config, we have basically a, like a baseline config, and then we have some, I think it's actually something to be cleaned up. We have baseline config, and then we have a few splits. So the splits, like I said, we really try to avoid site-specific. We failed. <laughs> <laughs> but we got a local, we got a local split, a non-prod, a prod split on the config side, and then we have a three, four, no, four site-specific splits. These are vendors that want to do really specific things. We just wanted to help them. We didn't want to kick them off the platform for having some some time, wanting to do something new. But it didn't translate well to the whole platform. So we do have four site-specific splits. The biggest one is for COVID. COVID, we had, we brought in a lot of resources, development resources for the COVID site, as you can imagine, during the pandemic to support them. We actually started them on seven, and we had to move them to nine. With a, or eight, it was eight at the time. We had to move them to eight in a few months. So yeah, it's, it's the short code of the site determines the database. We have an extra file that we add to settings.php that has a mapping of our short codes to their prod host, host names. And otherwise we use the server host variable to see what database and what environment is being used. But yeah, this is all, this is everything runs out of all 75 sites, use that config baseline and then have this web root in there. Um, is yeah. there a lot of, Custom modules specific to individual sites, or no? mainly COVID. COVID has one one module that's called like the COVID module, and it's only enabled on COVID. And it adds, what does it even? It's it adds a content type that they really wanted for vaccine FAQs. But we ended up adding a, a, a content type that I think they're using instead now. So we're actually trying to phase that out right now. There's most of our custom modules are platform wide. I want to get your question. I'm sorry. Um, part of the challenges, like through the RFP process, when you're like deciding when to pull the site in, yeah, is part of that like figuring out how web savvy that customer is. Like, you don't want to have conversations all day long with them on how to add content to the website. 
Well, absolutely great question. And Can I you should repeat the question for your Yes, of course. Uh, the, so the question was for when we're going through the RFP process, we're thinking about onboarding a new customer. Do we look at the tech savviness, the ability, the technical aptitude of the customer and the people who will be working on the site in that scenario? And the answer is absolutely. But I do want to tell you, we have some resources to help us with that. We have a great team. We really have it. We kind of, we have a sort of a, a two teams within a team. We have a development team. And we have a sort of what we call the business side of the team. And so they, we have Drupal admin experts. And I, for leadership, I've tried to compare them. Well, if anyone works with SharePoint, I'm not a huge fan of it. But <laughs> <laughs> SharePoint admins, you know, there, there's, a, there's a SharePoint admin role that is a very well compensated and respected role within the Microsoft admin community. And what I've said for our team is we have the equivalent in Drupal. We have people on that side. They may not all be committing code but they know how to do everything within the admin interface. And so they do a lot of training in that case. So we won't just turn someone away just because they're completely hopeless. I will say <laughs> there's, one per, there's one recent customer that was just, they were in Dreamweaver. They're in Dreamweaver, the site looks like it's from 1999. Yeah. And they're on a Windows server that was, I think another 50, 60 grand a year to, to host a Windows server. This is the kind of stuff that happens. It's waste, okay? So I find out about this. I said, let's just get them across the line. And it's, it's in ASPX, but there was hardly any dynamic content. So we ended up just redoing it. We just did a static site in S3. It cost pennies to run. I, I, I swear to you, it was a $50,000 a year server to run. We switched it into a static site. And that was one where we decided this person was not tech capable at all. It was one person doing it. It wasn't a team. And we just said, we're just going to move you to static site in S3. We set up a GitHub action so they could deploy the, from a staging bucket that was also just like, have you, have you have ever done like a static website hosted in S3? You can just have like static HTML files and JavaScript in S3 and run it as a site. So that's what we set up for them. And we just have a staging in a prod bucket. And we did that for them as a special case just to get them off that server and save that money. Normally, though, we'll have training. We have people who do. You know, web form specific training, full platform training. I'll actually show you, this is a really cool site that one of our team members did. And this is if you were doing training, and I went to the user login because that's where I usually start. We have this Digital Commons training site. This is the old theme version. And then I've set up for her a new, if we go to, I think it's a first. Oh, shoot. I have that one on the protected in the non-prod WAF. So that's our non-prod WAF at work there. It's working good. That's why I had WireGuard up. I mean, I can turn WireGuard on and probably get into it. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, so this is like this. So we have this, and so they log into this. Like we have our we have scheduled trainings. So they log in here, and they can see how content is built. Because sometimes you want to edit paragraphs to see how they're put together. You don't want to just create a paragraph from scratch for the first time. You can see, oh, this is what a good-looking paragraph looks like. And we have all the different elements, different stuff. These are all different paragraph types, pretty much. And some are, I think, like view embeds or or what have you. And so that's the old theme training. And then if I if WireGuard works for me, okay, sweet, okay. So this is the new theme training. So we're working on this one. So this is going to be the new one for sites. And again, that's the other thing that's a lift when I was talking about moving from that DNCR site from the old theme to new. We have to retrain all those people. Mm -hmm. They're great at the old theme, but the new theme has, so it actually has uses the same paragraph types. So it might not be that bad, but there are some different options, I think, particularly in some of the like nestable ones. Because this like horizontally, that's a, that's a paragraph, right? We call those bands. And so you can stack them, you know, you can put, you can create a four column, this is a four column band, has four paragraphs in it. And so there's like maybe some slightly different settings for this in terms of the padding and stuff. We made a lot of it better. Now I'll tell you, that was another challenge, talk about challenges, was going new, th having both themes, and we have one admin theme. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine, like if we wanna have different color options in here, with the same admin theme, we've done some hacky stuff that we really wanna wash our hands up just to change select boxes in some of the paragraphs to say different color names. Sounds like it's a dumb thing. But well, we just did it. We just did it with JavaScript in the ad in our admin theme. It based upon it just checks for what default theme there is, and it'll change some of the like form settings for these based upon what the default theme. We want to get rid of all of that as soon as we we're we're gonna uninstall that base theme, get it gone as soon as we can. We're not launching any new sites in it. That did not go over well. Any other <laughs> questions? But yeah, that was, I was a bad guy for that. I was a bad yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, so you mentioned that you use S3 for public files. Yes. Are you saying the S3FS module or yes, file system? Yes, the S3FS module. Do you, are you familiar? Somewhat. Do, have you used the Fly system? Has anyone used Fly system? You have used that? I've used both. That is what I would like to do. I have seen on the Tesla website, right? So y'all have y'all seen this? Y'all know they're D9, right? Are they still D9? I blocked the JavaScript. I didn't 
So they use fly system, and this is one thing, if you run into this, if you use S3 for public files, we have run into a problem, where is their aggregated JavaScript? Somewhere in here. There it is, okay. Can I zoom in on the source view? Yeah, a little bit. All right. so this is Tesla? This is Tesla, so they're using fly system, I think, but see how, I think they're using fly system so that the S3 hosted public files, and if you use S3FS, at least for us, when you aggregate JavaScript, it goes to your S3. They've got fly system, so it appears to originate from Tesla.com. Ours code, we have everything coming out of another domain. And so we found when we aggregate JavaScript, it breaks some of the admin Ajax stuff. Mm. So we haven't been able to aggregate JavaScript in D9. Mm. So that's where I've been looking at Tesla. I think with fly system, we can make it so that with like a proxy or something, it seems like the public files that are from our JS and CSS aggregation are coming from the site in question and not our unified file. We have just like one bucket that serves all the files and each site has a prefix. And we just set the prefix per site. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's one thing I really like. I want to aggregate JavaScript. But when we've done it, like I said, I have this issue. And I think it's because we're not doing what Tesla's doing here. Uh, we do aggregate CSS, and so that's served out of files.nc.gov, and that's great, because it takes a lot of requests off the, you know, the servers. Um, any, any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks, y'all. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, go ahead. Please. That's good. I'm glad. More from the business perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what size is the engineering team that works on the solution? Great question. Well, it's myself, and we have a senior front-end developer. We have a UX developer, and one thing we really emphasized with that was we wanted them to be able to, to write CSS and JavaScript, be a, sort of at least a mid-level front-end contributor, but they're also a designer and UX developer. So that's three. So my, I'm kind of the, uh, and then we, we just recently got a great new hire from NC State's College of Engineering. We stole him from over there, and he's a solutions architect with AWS, and he's kind of doing the DevOps side. Um, he's working on getting us off, because we're on CentOS 7, and we need to get off of that. So we're moving off of that. We're looking at alternatives. If y'all, I don't know, do y'all have any operating system recommendations? No, we're looking at Amazon Linux. I don't know. Um, but he's helping me with that. So we've got so a, sort of a DevOps guy. We've got me as kind of lead um, sort of DevOps and Drupal, and then two front ends. And then, like I said, we have some people who kind of are between the two teams I mentioned, and they're very advanced in doing things with web forms and views. Um, and they've contributed some code, and they're trying to learn. We really try to mentor. We really try to bring people up. Um, because I had some great mentors when I started out. I didn't really know Drupal that well when I started here. Um, so it's, I guess, what is that? So that's one, two, three, four, four really like five. It's a very small team. That's a um, I tell you, I, I don't, I'm not sure how I'm standing here and telling you that we migrated all those sites. There were times where I thought we were going to make it. <laughs> I really, I don't know. We, we figured it out. We got it done. Would you say that the value proposition to your customers is that is that cost savings of, of not having to maintain their own code base? And Absolutely, and like I said, I, I really I had the rigor from the community colleges system. They're paying fifty grand right yet right now for hosting and support only. There's no no development. I guess maybe there'd be break fixes. I hope they're keeping the contrib modules up to date, but I'm not actually really sure. I need to check. <laughs> I don't think that would be. I mean, they might not be. I don't feel like I they're. Really, count on it. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, there's there, people. They get scammed. This, this also the other thing that I think we bring in terms of just cost savings, leverage when they're negotiating. If they want to go somewhere else, they can kind of say, "Well, we do have this other option." Sometimes, you know, they'll know like, "Oh, you have nowhere else to go. You got to go with us. We got you now." And they can play hardball, and us being there as an alternative, and those even on those cases that have a little weird functional requirements that are outside of our scope, we still help those some in someone in that way. Yeah, pretty small team. We'd like to grow it. Um, we'd like to grow it, but we're working on that. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Right. Well, thanks. Well, that was, that was fun talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Okay.